minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff. All right, all right, all right. Welcome, everyone. You get the horn show. Tad and Jeff here. Uh, we have another guest tonight, back to back weeks, and uh, I'm very excited to uh, to speak with this guest as well. This is someone who I have read and uh, and and enjoyed for a long time, and this gentleman is author, sports writer, uh, legend. Uh, <laughs> As it pertains to uh, over three thousand articles uh, written in the in the newspaper, uh, John Eisenberg, and uh, so John, welcome to the show. Very uh, happy to have you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate the, that intro. Yeah, it's great <laughs> to be here. I look forward to it. Yeah, I think we're going to have some fun, and you know, we we've got uh, plenty of things to talk about. Uh, you have uh, your new book out, Rocket Men. Uh, which is really kind of uh, looking at an historic view of the black quarterback in the NFL. There it is right there. Uh, you know, the black quarterback uh, revolution in the NFL and in sports in general. And I think it's a really, really interesting historical perspective kind of, you know, from, from past days. And we all know, of course, about, you know, stereotypes that existed uh, around black quarterbacks to, you know, the, the league that we see today. But before we jump even into that, just to kind of give people a little bit of, you know, history on you. Um, obviously an author, sports writer, uh, started in newspapers, you've written over 3000, uh, you know, articles and, uh, and then eventually migrated into writing books. Uh, and so up until I believe last year, you were, uh, worked for the Baltimore Ravens and, and wrote lots of articles on their app and website and everything. We're very close to the team. So I thought it was really interesting as well, because you were, clearly up close and personal with uh, with a young black quarterback in Lamar Jackson, who's kind of, you know, the latest evolution of where the uh, the, the quarterback position is uh, not only overall, but particularly as it pertains to the black quarterbacks, you know, in your time covering the team, you were there obviously when they made the decision to, to draft Lamar and starting him off and, you know, all of those types of things. So I guess, you know, if you wouldn't mind kind of diving into just, what you were able to observe even from a Lamar Jackson coming into a team like Baltimore and what that's like, again, not so much maybe as a black quarterback per se, but just as a young dynamic quarterback and what he brings to an established coaching staff and those types of things. Well, yeah, it's it, what's interesting because it, it's both sides of the coin. Uh, I did watch it <clears throat> and I was there. Uh, I remember being in the building the night of the draft when when they you know traded back into the first into the first round and took him and the building just shook. I mean, and th those were the people in the, the war room, so to speak. They had drafted Lamar Jackson, and you knew instantly it was going to change the course of the franchise. They didn't draft him because he was a black quarterback. I mean, what's interesting, race really had nothing to do with it. And uh, the the Ravens, uh, as I wrote this book, are definitely a team. And uh, from the get-go, I mean, they, they, they've had the first black general manager in the NFL, Ozzie Newsom, who shaped their roster from the very beginning. And they've sort of been a real example of what can happen when you don't just have all white, you know, that's what went on for years, uh, was the guys shaping the rosters were white. And, and you know, and, and those stereotypes you alluded to were allowed to continue. Well, here comes Ozzie with a whole different perspective and so from the get-go, the Ravens have had a lot of black quarterbacks. Lamar, uh, uh, you know, they they knew instantly when they drafted him. Uh, you know, what, what happened to him? I mean, I did watch it up close. And here's a guy, it's half the reason I wrote the book, because here's the guy when he was at the Combine that year, the Chargers scout said, are you going to run the 40 because you'd be a good wide receiver? And this is a Heisman Trophy winner and uh, uh, unbelievable talent. And uh, there were other people making comments like that. Bill Polian and different people had real thoughts that maybe he shouldn't be. So that's a vestige of what went on. We're in year almost 100 of the NFL, and, and this is still happening. And he comes in, and, and uh, of course, his story is well told, but he, as a rookie, gets the job. And then the second year, they trade Joe Flacco, and he's the quarterback, and he's MVP in the NFL. 
uh, in his second year after less than two years after being told he would be a good uh, wide receiver in the NFL. <laughs> so that had a lot of that sort of uh, was a key piece of the motivation why I should write this book, uh, because it's sort of uh, amazing to me that it's still going on, but it is. And so, uh, you know, seeing Lamar up close, uh, definitely. And he has a huge chip on his shoulder as a result of all mm. that. And he always will, I think. And so because he's never been a cookie cutter guy. Yeah. And so uh, watching him up close and getting to know him a little bit is definitely a piece of why I wrote this book. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting. And, and you know, look, we know. So the, the new book, I want to say it again, make sure everyone understands that the new book's called Rocket Men, the Black Quarterbacks Who Revoli- Revolutionized Pro Football book was just released uh, a couple weeks ago, but I believe it's your 11th book overall. Am I quoting that correctly? That is, you have done it. Good job. All yeah. <laughs> so your 11th book overall, you're a prolific writer. I'm curious, how long did it take to write this book really from inception, from the time you started, maybe not the inception of the idea, but from the time you started just the, uh, the research and everything, to the time that it actually gets published, what's the time frame for something like that? This one was uh, three years. Three years. I, I signed a contract to do this book uh, uh, in 2020 uh, during the pandemic. Wow. And uh, I had the same publisher uh, that my prior book called The League uh, is about uh, the early days of the NFL through the through the eyes of the stories of the founding, basically the founding father owners who drag it through the mud when it was not a popular sport at all. And that one did extremely well. That one uh, really it sold better than any of my books. And and it continues to sell. And its fourth year was one of the best-selling sports books on Amazon. So, so uh, same publisher. And uh, this one was a whole different deal because... Um, I started 1920. I tell the story. It's a linear narrative. I, you know, I start with Fritz Pollard in 1920, the first year of the NFL. And, and so forward through his story. And then the period of time when the NFL was entirely white, sort of an unknown, a lot of fans don't know that, but it was just like baseball for 12 years and uh, right up until right after World War II. And then move forward to so much that went on in the story of black quarterbacks, the guys that first got in in the 50s, the ones that actually got onto the field in the 60s and 70s, and then 80s, the first black quarterbacks who really played. And, uh, you know, Doug Williams wins the Super Bowl, uh, Randall Cunningham with the Eagles, Warren Moon is on the cover of the book. Um, just, and so, you know, that's that era. And then the you fast forward more, uh, the era of the last 15 years, we, Cam Newton and Colin Kaepernick, you know, before everything that went on with him, you know, was an unbelievable quarterback in his first years and and then through Lamar. So it's just a huge story. It's a big canvas with a lot <laughs> of of uh, errors. So I had a lot of errors to research on and off the field and, and what's going on with race relations in America, because it's a it's a big story. And so it just it just took a long time. And uh, most <laughs> yeah, of my I other books uh, have been maybe one year or two year. They've covered a narrative three years. This one's a hundred. So, uh, you know, it, it took, it seemed yeah. like forever to be honest with you. It took, it took a long time. Wow. So where do you start like with something like that? Like, how, like obviously you're not getting an interview from Fritz. Uh, I mean, where, where are you <laughs> like, I, I, where are you starting at? Like how, how, how are you st- in your mind, okay, I'm going to start for a hundred years and move, you know, move forward. So are you starting it, you know, year one and building the book that way, or are you building it in pieces? Like, how are you, how, how well, are you uh, doing that? It's a great question. And every book is different because sometimes like I, I wrote a book about uh, Cal Ripken's uh, consecutive game streak and Luke Garrick. Yeah. And that was a real challenge from a narrative perspective, because if you start in the beginning, and you tell the Lou Gehrig story, then Cal Ripken, who's the one everybody knew, didn't sh- doesn't show up till the second half of the book. So you couldn't do that. You had to. I started first chapter was twenty one thirty one when Cal broke the Gehrig's record. Right. I start there, and then you go back, and you had to weave in two different things. That was a tough one, okay? Because it's like it's not linear. It's not just told chronologically. This book unfolds pretty chronologically, as you said. You know, I start with Fritz Pollard. And just move forward. I think this story needs to be told chronologically to, for it to, to understand how it slowly, ever so slowly builds. And so it made sense for, to me 
in my brain, it made sense, you know, uh, start at the beginning and go forward. And uh, fortunately, I, you know, worked with some great editors at Basic Books and, and they agreed with me. So uh, that's how you're you're writing the book. Is that how you are putting the book together? So now if you're starting with Fritz, are you doing it? You're, I, you know, I'm assuming you're, you're, you're shaping the book out, but like, are you going now doing your research now on, on Fritz and, and that, that era and then moving to the next one and the next one? Cause I know you did a lot of interviews and some of these guys were older guys. So I, I would think, you know, age would play a factor into that. Like, Hey, I need, if I have an opportunity to interview this guy now, let me do this now. Let me not wait a year and a half because who knows. Right. So w- what's kind of your process there with, um, with building the book? I don't start interviewing guys until I'm sort of in their era, researching okay. and writing, uh, until I get a grasp on, I do, I don't, I don't write a word for six months. I, I, I sort of need to play it out of my head a little bit. Who am I going to highlight? Where do I, who, which guys do I highlight in this story? And certainly the ones that played a lot, it's easy. I know I'm going to be dealing with them. I knew I was going to be interviewing, you know, James Harris and Warren Moon and these guys, but there's a lot of guys and they're in the book. Uh, you know, I called it Rocket Man because uh, the title is meant as a compliment. And certainly you see the guys playing today, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar. I mean, they're a rocket. Man. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> but, you know, the guys that there's tons of guys, they'd stand on the shoulders of guys that, that were really good and, and really didn't get a chance to play. And so I, I intended that as a, as a compliment to them. And so you just move through it. Uh, you know, I had to tell those stories as well. Now that was really difficult and, you know, f- figuring out which guys to highlight that didn't even play in the NFL or, or very little, but, uh, stand as examples of guys that didn't get a chance. So that took some, you know, some weeding out some, you, know, you can't, you can't do it all. But, uh, so I, you know, I hope I hit the ones that were appropriate. So th- that was pretty painstaking. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine it is, you know, it's a it's a monumental task to take on 100 years of history and then condense it down and make it also interesting and, and you know, and captivating to the to the reader. And, you know, that's a uh, that's a that's a big, big job. And certainly it took you three years to be able to accomplish it. But uh, you certainly you certainly did. Yes. And, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, what's really funny, as I always tell people this by the end of it, I, I like to have the book memorized. I have, I have it memorized. Yeah. I've, I've gone over everything. Right. There's 500 and something footnotes in there. And, wow. uh, you know, uh, this is a sensitive subject. And, and I, I wanted to make sure that I was on solid ground uh, from a, you know, from a source perspective. So I went over those footnotes again and again and again. And wow. uh, even double fact checking all that stuff. So, yeah, by the end of it, I like, I do. It's sort of in my, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's all sort of in my head. So you <laughs> practically have a 400 page book memorized. <laughs> Not that anyone necessarily wants to have to have that done, but yeah, I think just repetition just shows people out there right. trying to memorize something, just repetition. Right. Yeah. Um, and then look, I think we all from, you know, kind of a high level, we know, you know, the, the stereotypes uh, around black quarterbacks in the NFL historically and the fact that they just weren't given that opportunity for such a long time. So when you were doing the research for this book, you obviously spoke with so many players like we talked about of different ages and backgrounds. When you're going through and kind of collecting all this information, did anything that you learned kind of truly surprise you or was it largely what you expected when you began the process? Uh, it, it, several things surprised me. Uh, uh, certainly talking to James Harris was an unbelievable interview, a guy that uh, played in the NFL in the 70s, really the first black quarterback that a, an NFL team said, you'll be our starter. It was with the Los Angeles Rams in 1974. Marlon Briscoe played before him, but the Broncos did that strictly in 1968 for five games. He started because they had to, all their other quarterbacks were hurt, and they never gave him another chance after that. And he had to switch positions. To play and he was great on the field there there's no doubt he could have been a, a really good quarterback but so james harris tells me the story of uh he's just such a great storyteller and and so his story surprised me when he told me the story of going up he's drafted by the buffalo bills in 1969 in the eighth round he's 6'4 220 pounds can throw it a mile he's a dean's list student 
you know, he should be a first round draft pick. He, he goes in the eighth round and he goes up to Buffalo and it's the year they drafted OJ Simpson. And so OJ's the big star and they go up for a rookie camp and the, the team puts OJ up at a, at the Hilton and they put James Harris up at the Y uh, in a, in a $6 room. And then he hangs around. He does it's football was very different. He didn't have an agent. And his college coach, Eddie Robinson, legendary coach at Grambling, is negotiating his contract with the Bills. So James goes to them and says, look, you know, while he's negotiating the contract, like, I need a little money if I want to go get a sandwich or something. So they gave him a job cleaning his teammates' cleats in the locker room. Uh, And, you know, he tells me this story just in a deadpan way. And it's just stunning. And, and, and so, it, and by the end of that summer, by the way, of that training camp, he's, he starts the season opener for the team that he was cleaning his teammates cleats. In the <laughs> so uh, that surprised me. That's a story that just really floored me. And, uh, uh, when I hung up from that interview, I said, I think I have a pretty good book here. I mean, this, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is really good. This is really good. So that, that one got me. Well, and I love that story. I love that story in the book because, you know, I thought it was so interesting, even that juxtaposition when you're looking at the position, because as you mentioned, they had just, they were drafting OJ Simpson at the same time. And so it's, it's so interesting that like both, like they're both black players, but it's, it's almost by virtue of the position that they're playing that yeah. it's almost like the black quarterback and eh, he's not really even going to play an important role for this team. We know that. Versus the black running back, who we know is going to be a, a big star, or we expect that. I just think that, that I thought that was such an interesting juxtaposition yeah. between those things. It is. It's it's very interesting. Uh, you know, James is from the South, uh, deep South. He's from a uh, historically black college. He, he went up there. He'd never really been around white people, as he said. And so it was just different than OJ. And, uh, you know, I think the team had no problem sort of casting dispersions on him that way, which is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty bad to, to, to hear those stories. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're, you're, it is very interesting how, uh, you know, OJ got the Royal treatment, uh, but James Harris, uh, dealt with, uh, a lot of that, uh, throughout his, really throughout his career. He is a real, it's a reason he, the introduction to the book is James Harris, uh, because there, when he goes up to Buffalo in 1969, there are no black quarterbacks. Marlon Briscoe had, had, First off, that's the AFL. It's not the yep. NFL. It's right. the last year of the AFL. There were the NFL was slower, and uh, but uh, th- there was just no track record at all. He 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 carved a career out uh, of an era where there was no track record. So pretty amazing guy uh, historically. Yeah, that's incredible. And Jeff, I want you to go into this next question because this is something Jeff and I were talking before you came on prior to the show about. You know, just the timing, certain players that, uh, you know, would have definitely fit in in, you know, in the NFL. And it was almost just a just bad timing that whether it was their style of play would have been perfect for today's. Jeff, you and I were talking about a particular guy that we can, you know, kind of ask John about. But I just think in general, that bigger that bigger question (laughs) exists. But uh, but yeah, Jeff, why don't you why don't you take that away? Yeah. So it was, you know, the, the, the quarterback that came to mind, like, man just tailor made for this, this NFL was Cordell Stewart. And, you know, I guess our question was at that point is like, okay, he was amazing back then. Like the stuff he was doing on the field, we weren't really seeing, right. We probably had that with, with moon and, and, you know, those players, but you know, he was doing stuff on the field that, you know, his whole slash role, right. He was doing all that stuff. And it was like, okay, Obviously, they the Steelers saw how good this guy was, but yet they didn't want to build an offense around him. Now, it it was hard for me to say that that would have just been, you know, because of race. You know, the Steelers are, are you know well known for you know for having, uh, you know, that they're legends, you know, are, are of of black players. But was it is it just a different time now, or you know, the teams just weren't interested in? building an offense around a running quarterback, it, you know, it, I don't know if it's you can a great expand question. Yes. And, and it's really one of the, it's a key part of the book that I, that I sort of, you ask about the writing process. It just sort of evolved in my head as I went along writing and it really came to understand it better as I reported along. And that is the style of football in the NFL. Uh, you know, for, it, very clearly for many decades, uh, the, the, all the quarterbacks were white drop back, 
quarterbacks. That's all they wanted. Yeah. It was a mark against you if you had mobility. They didn't want yeah. you leaving the pocket. Coaches didn't want yeah. you doing it. They would lose control. The offensive linemen hated it. Uh, used to tell jokes, you know, about Fran Tarkenden, who was what you know, scrambling. They didn't, you know, nobody wanted that. He's like, that's a great yeah. one. Yeah. So they, you know, it was a style of football, and 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 a number of black quarterbacks just, uh, if they had come along, I mean, a guy like Turner Gill, okay, is a name. He played at Nebraska in the eighties when the rest was really good. He never lost a game in college. And, and he, he went to, to Canada and was a great quarterback there before concussions shortened his career. Well, if he comes along in today's NFL and, you know, maybe he's not an amazing passer, but he's a good passer and has the force of a franchise behind him. He could have been really good, could have been really good. And, and, and so Cordell Stewart comes along a decade later uh, and he, you know, good for the Steelers for putting him out there. And they did let him run more. They let him run more than than the dropbacks were. So it was a step in that direction for me uh, that really became clear to me. I mean, slowly from the 80s, when you see Randall Cunningham and the Eagles starting to run around and they'll let you do that. And, you know, some white quarterbacks, too. Steve Young uh, and Elway was mobile and, and different guys. But it never the NFL still wanted. The, if you fast forward to 2010, say, look at the who's it's that's the era of Tom Brady, Peyton, Ben uh-huh. Roethlisberger, who's winning still the white drop back quarterbacks. And that's what they wanted. It never really changed from, I don't think, until 2011, Cam Newton and Kaepernick get drafted in 2012, Robert Griffin uh, and Russell Wilson. OK, and I think Andrew Luck is in there, too. Also mobile. Uh, so those guys came in, okay, and they were so good. They could run, they were mobile, they could throw, they were smart. They immediately started winning. And I think the NFL finally said, we, you're not going to have to be a drop back quarterback. We're going to change. We're changing the way we play football. You know, team by team, it happened, sort of became accepted. I think that's the moment from that year, 2011 and 12, fast forward to where we are today, where every team has RPOs and and the quarterback position right. has really changed. I think it's happened in the last 12 or 13 years. Uh, before then, you just had guys like Cordell and different ones, Michael Vick, obviously another, who slowly yeah. but surely opened the eyes of the mm-hmm. league to what can happen. And it's actually a good thing if your quarterback's mobile. <laughs> so uh, slowly right. but surely it happened and didn't really take off until the last 10 or 12 years. Well. Wow. That's amazing to think it's been that just short of a time, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, it's, that's nothing well, in football. A hundred year history. And we're talking about yeah. the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, Michael Vick, the first time, and he would, uh, I think 2006 was the first time they really started putting RPOs in for him. And he was in his fifth or sixth year at that point. And you know, what, a, what a, the team wasn't great, but what a concept. Uh, to yeah. start giving, you know, letting the quarterback make some decisions at the line and stuff like that. And so it really is the last 15 years wow. that it's it's completely changed. Well, you know, something that struck me, too, you know, between just the book and the topic and when Jeff and I were talking about it, is that it struck me that the prolifer- the proliferation of black head coaches in high school, college and the NFL has to play a role as well. You know, I almost feel like there could be a. Uh, not that you want to sign up for another three year uh, mission on doing this, but there could be a companion book that yeah. could be written just about, you know, black coaches, uh, because I do think that has certainly played a huge role as well. And so I was really curious, did any of the players that you when you were doing your research and interviews, did any of them kind of point to specific coaches who were maybe more progressive and, and just open minded about the idea of having a black quarterback? Well, historically, there are definitely some. I mean, you go way back. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, how many of your 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 uh, listeners, you know, Chuck Knox was a guy that was a really nice winning football coach in the NFL in the 70s. And he's the guy in 1974 was coaching the L.A. Rams. He's the guy that said, looked at his quarterback room and said, I want him to be my starter. And it was James Harris. He was really the first one. Wow. So you have to give him credit for that. He didn't see color. And uh, he definitely did that. Joe Gibbs would be another. Uh, Joe Gibbs, uh, the story of Doug Williams, which I tell in the book, never who goes who wins the Super Bowl and such a such a moment for this story. He wouldn't. I don't know whether he would have been in the NFL. I mean, uh, the year he was being drafted, 
uh, there was no combine yet. He was coming out of Grambling and teams would go and uh, go to the campus of the player and scout them there and have a visit. One team visited Doug Williams. It was the Tampa Bay Bucks. Joe Gibbs was offensive coordinator of the Tampa Bay Bucks. 1978, he goes down. They said, well, we kind of the scouts. We, he's a big guy and he could throw it. Let's go talk to him. So he goes down, comes back and says, take him, take him. <laughs> and, and so they did. So it's guys like that that, uh, you know, were willing to go against the grain when uh, there was so much uh, ideology, really. It was ideology working against him. That same year, Warren Moon was undrafted. Warren Moon didn't get drafted. He won the Rose Bowl. Won the Rose Bowl. And, and would throw for 70,000 yards as a professional, <laughs> you know, and it did not get drafted. So it tells you where, where things were. So it, took, it did take uh, people, you know, white, uh, they were white coaches. So obviously, yes, when you move along and have, have black coaches and black general managers, and that's changed a lot. Not enough in the NFL, I would say. They're having a real issue there. And I'm not sure the league knows what to do about that. But um, uh, they, they don't seem to be able to solve that one. But um, it's definitely helped the, the, the just having the sets of eyes on quarterbacks that say, I like you, uh, you know, it's just, it's just changed things dramatically, the high school and the college level. Yeah, I would have to think so. I mean, it just, it, you know, it makes such a big difference because, you know, like you were saying, I mean, you have these, these players who have been on these teams and the coaches are the ones looking at them going, nah, I'm not going to play you. I'm not going to give you that chance. And so, you know, I do think that as we start to see again, even nowadays, even on the high school and college level, more, you know, black head coaches, I have to believe then that, you know, that, that, that only helps because you do have those, you know, um, I'm trying to think, was it, uh, Ozzie Newsom, I believe that was, you know, going to be a, uh, quarterback and then ended up going over to, to be a tight end because right. he was looking at the other quarterbacks and realized he didn't see anyone like him. Right. And it made more sense to, you know, go elsewhere. And obviously, you know, one of the best ever and a hall of famer and everything else, but you know, I do think that having a coach that you are comfortable with or that you see yourself in, uh, you know, probably does make it a little bit easier for those for those players when they're young, you know, to to, to get on that quarterback path. There's uh, Dante Culpepper uh, drafted by the Minnesota Vikings in 1999 out of Central Florida. It was really good for about five years until he got hurt. The name, yeah. Really good. Uh, his touchdown to interception ratio, his career... <laughs> I mean, that, that's a guy that could it was outstanding. Uh, but when he shows up to the Minnesota Vikings in 1999, and this is in the book, the, the head coach is black, the offensive coordinator is black, uh, the position coach, I believe, was black, and uh, the first string quarterback. was. It, it was the first time, and he addressed it. He said it's the first, you know, as a young player, that he, he realized he probably was not going to be judged like other people had been judged. And so that was great for him. I mean, and it was isolated. It was an isolated situation, but it, it did happen in Minnesota. Denny Green was the coach in 1999, and he had a lot of black assistants. And uh, so that was great and a winning team. Uh, so it, it, it did happen a little bit, but, uh, uh, you know, the coaching piece of it is really, really key. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jeff, what do you got? No, I mean, it, it seems like we've, we, um, I guess as a society or, you know, the NFL, like, it's come a long way, right? I mean, we're looking at, I won't, uh, almost 50% starting quarterbacks, at least week one, uh, were black. Yep. I, I want to say it was somewhere 14-ish. 14. 14, 14. 14. And the league put out so, a release. The league made sure everybody knew. Put out put on social media. And that's funny. Oh, man. That's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Graphic. So, a a graphic. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unbelievable. So, do, do we think we're past this this point now? I mean, you know, with your book, you know, you know, just talking about like the the struggle. Like, do we do we think now it, it's we're? I mean, obviously, I don't know that we're ever going to be past. You know, I'm not talking racism, I guess, but right. I, I'm talking like you're a football player. Like we, you know, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether, you know, what position you play, do you think we're past that now where we're not seeing like, who cares? Like is there parity know? among quarterback candidates? Basically? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, certainly huge strides have been made and, 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 
And uh, the first, I mean, it took until 57 Super Bowls to have two black starters, but at least we did. And then uh, months later, three out of the first four picks are black quarterbacks. And then a few months later, uh, the opening weekend, 14 starters out of 32, as noted by the league. Um, you know, so we clearly know things have changed. It, it, but it, will it ever be? I mean, uh, it's better. Is it all the way? Uh, you know, occasionally vestiges. James Harris told me, he says, it continues. It continues, believe me. And I said, okay. And, and occasionally where you will see it is the journeyman, you know, the, 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 the backup pop, the backup quarterback population is still majority white. Definitely white. And it seems that teams are more comfortable with less and less so. But, you know, if you if you do the numbers, there's no doubt about it. Uh, You know, you see the journeyman guy who's bounced around the league forever. The Chase Daniels, you know, of, of (laughs) of the world, you know, never started. But, you know, when you start seeing a black quarterback in that role, you'll know things have really changed. And I'm not saying I hate I hate painting with a broad brush in this because there are examples and things are changing. Tyrod Taylor would be one, another one drafted by Ozzie Newsom. And, uh, you know, has finally, I think, out of the league after 12 or 13 years, uh, uh, mostly as a backup. Uh, and, and and there are others, uh, you know, Joshua Dobbs, uh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, did a real nice job with the Cardinals. <laughs> He's played three oh, fantastic point. games. Yeah, he has yeah. played so, excellent just yeah. getting that chance to actually start. I mean, you know, in right. fairness, he was behind Ben. I mean, you're not – nobody yeah, was starting over it. Ben. So, sure. I mean, but the fact that, yeah, he's now – you know, he got traded for and he's now their starter and playing extremely well. I mean, just – Oh, it's changed. What I've been able to yeah. When you see that back up, uh, the, the clipboard holders, you know, majority, I, I think you'll know things have, have really changed. And, of course, look, you know, as we mentioned in, in the outset, I mean, Lamar – you know, is told to be he can be a good wide receiver. You know, that's five years ago. So it's it's not yeah. uh, you know it's not all the way done, but uh, certainly better than it was. And so, do you think? And and I guess we're we're backtracking a little bit here. The whole Lamar thing, because I you know I've read that and I've heard that. Where surely that didn't come from race. Like that just has to be someone just being just. It, just not understanding the game. Is that what it was? Or do, do we think, you know, I don't, you know, Bill Polian was one of them that said it. Like, I don't think Bill, you know, would, you know, yeah. it's not racist, obviously, but like, where did that stem from? Where did that root from? I mean, this guy was a Heisman Trophy winner and you're telling him, yeah, you think he'd be a good wide receiver. It's, that's insane to me. Like, I, I just like, wh- what did he well, think he of it? Or what, you know, where do <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Lamar, Lamar would be good at anything, you know. Sure, he, he, of course he, he would be, be. yeah. So he's not wrong, but it's just right. like, well, it's not the position he plays. But, uh, right. you know, so I don't know. I mean, that is, uh, you know, it's not just flat out, I agree. I mean, it's not, in, in some cases, again, painting with a broad brush, I'm very cautious about. It. Some cases it was. It, it, it comes out, it was in the DNA. It was in the DNA of the of, of maybe not you know the group think in the in the nfl was you know the a black quarterback you know guy he, he's not he wasn't smart enough you know would he could he lead could he de- produce in the clutch you know all these things that those were the real racist ideology and you know i, I don't think that's in existence anymore but somewhere in there you know a uh, hesitancy to to just all the way grant, uh, you know, to occasionally, it's a reflex almost. It's almost a reflex. It's like, golly, you know, these guys could do this, that, and the other. You know, maybe that would be good. Uh, so uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly where that comes from. But uh, it's it's what was there. And, uh, you know, you can, you can question a lot of things. You remember when Kyler Murray signed his contract uh, a year ago and they put in a clause that said you can't play – video games or whatever yeah. it was. And, you know, Warren Moon, who's a keeper of the flame. I interviewed Warren at length and, and, you know, he jumped all over that. You know, he was the first one, you know, he said, wait, he said, hold on. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, that I dealt with in 1978, 1980. And that was wow. it's just a different perspective, you know, different line of questioning and different treatment. 
you know, maybe it isn't just flat out race, but it's just like, you can't do, you know, you know, something, something clicks and you raise that question. And, uh, you know, so Warren is great. You know, he's, a, he's the first one to say, you know, well, hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that's just last year. So, uh, yeah. uh, but let you, me ask, okay. So John, I'm sorry. I, I want to understand this a little bit more and I don't, I, I, obviously I want to be cautious of the, the time yeah. and also the waters that we're wading into here, but something like that. Right. So we don't know, obviously what Kyler Murray is like with that team or what we've seen. Is there in your mind sometimes maybe a danger of, even if it's Warren Moon, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, looking at that and then just assuming right. that that is somehow race-based, whereas maybe the team legitimately, regardless of color, saw a guy who just wasn't spending the time studying and working to achieve his potential, and they did something to try to, you know, prevent that from being an issue and then right. it's it, they do run that risk though of then getting called out i have to think for teams that can also be a slippery slope sometimes it's a very slippery slope you, you just have to be very careful because uh uh no we i mean i'm i'm not in the cardinals meetings i'm not in their you know organizational <laughs> i don't know what's going on there it, it's it's just the the question that you know Warren would say was all right if you have 50 people in that position uh, 50 quarterbacks, you know, how many black quarterbacks would they have that? How many quarterbacks would have it written into their contract that are black or that are white? You know, he'd say, now we don't have the answer there. We don't know. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, if you going on history, you you have a suspicion what's what's happening there. And that's all it is. That's yeah. all it can be. And so uh, any team is allowed to do whatever they want with their players. But, uh, you know, you, you, yeah. you do. And then, you know, so of course we don't know exactly, we're not privy to all the details. Maybe they did have some concerns, but, uh, you know, with reason, but uh, you gotta, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a situation where too many guys have been through too many situations that yeah. just had the same scent. It's just too many guys, you know, they, they, yes. they, just, they just were like, you know, golly, because obviously we've moved beyond it on a macro level. But, you know, it's just, uh, you know, kind no, of and the history is there. You're right. And yeah. so those guys uh, and again, it doesn't matter if it's a Warren Moon or Doug Williams, or they have been through that in so many different ways that, you know, I'm sure they they have that lens of kind of seeing it and, it, and it's going to strike them, you know, in a certain way. And and look, it's very possible that they're. Correct. You know, uh, we, we certainly can't rule that out. It's uh, it is interesting. And I'm sure other teams probably saw the way that played out and said, well, OK, this we're going to keep our hands off of that because the Cardinals right. couldn't have handled that much more poorly than they did in the grand scheme of things anyway. Yeah. Don't put it in writing. I mean, you right. know, yeah. whatever. you know, right. you got to. You know, listen, there are a lot of teams that have to deal with a lot of players of all <laughs> races and everything. Yes. They all do various things. But, uh, you know, and that's a lot of money. There was a lot of money on the table. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, you know, my, my point with with uh, with writing the book really was just to sort of shine a light on the history and to sort of put it in context. Uh, you know, just so everyone understood. I mean, I've been a journalist for 40 something years. It's my life's work. And. And, you know, I've always felt like, you know, this is a truth. This is truth. This happened. And so for people to just understand that now, if there's echoes of it today, that's it's actually sort of I mean, if people are interested in it, uh, understandably. And, you know, we certainly don't want it to ever happen again. You only want it to right. get better, not worse. But, uh, you know, I, what's really what I really want people to understand is that it happened. And, yeah. uh, you know, this game that we all love. And just let's, you know, let's make sure that that's understood. Well, that's fantastic. A, and yeah, you did yeah. an incredible job of, of bringing that to light, you know, and, yeah. uh, and it's yeah. Very cool. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. What were you getting ready? Yeah, to? absolutely. No, I was just say like, you just think of a, a 20 or a 25 year old who just, you know, they don't know this history. Right. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's great timing. You know, ever you just think like, Oh, there's always been these quarterbacks. Like, no, like, these guys went through a lot. Like it's just, and it's yeah. a fantastic book just to, to show the groundwork that was laid. And yes, it took us way too long to get to this position, but man, we, 
fans are reaping the benefits of this. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, you you look at you know just Patrick Mahomes and just the magic he does, and to think like there was a time where a Patrick Mahomes would have wouldn't have been able to play in the NFL. You know, it's just and. You know, I think back, you know, to baseball and you look at like Babe Ruth and you're just like, oh, Babe Ruth was so amazing. But like, man, could you imagine like the competition that he would have had, you know, if, if, yeah. if the black yeah. players could have played against him? You know, it's like it's just it's fantastic to see. So it's a, a fantastic book. Um, it, you did an amazing job with it. I'm, I'm about a halfway through at this point. So um, so I, I'm I'm excited to read the, the rest of it. But um, but just great timing on this too just with all the recognition and and just how all these players are getting drafted now and it's just awesome to see where they came from well thank you i mean it is it's a story of opportunity really it's a story about opportunity more than anything else that's how that's how i look at it marlon briscoe who we talked about you know he and lamar jackson in many ways their stories are the same all right they they do not come out of a power five conference their skill set is a little bit different out of line than what the league wanted uh, Marlon, they both got on the field as rookies. Uh, they both did well as rookies. Marlon, uh, Lamar Jackson, as we said, you know, they, they, in today's football, they gave him the keys to the offense. He's MVP of the league his second year. So 50 years before that, Marlon Briscoe is told, you're never going to play quarterback again, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just opportunity. He did, the story's the same. He just, and the talents were similar. He didn't get the opportunity. So uh, it is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of amazing that, that it happened. Uh, but, uh, as I said, I just wanted to shine a light on it. No, oh, you did. And, and listen, you know, before, as we start to wrap up here, cause you have other obligations, but one thing I wanted to make sure that we mention, uh, cause you are Baltimore based and they are actually, they, there's an event coming up at the university of Maryland. Uh, the Philip Merrill college of journalism, is having a kind of, I guess, a symposium, if you will, on the rise of the black quarterback. Right. Uh, you will be there along with someone who we mentioned uh, several times throughout this conversation, none other than Doug Williams, along with Mike Loxley and, you know, lots of other people that are kind of yep. involved in the game. Uh, and it's really all about this this topic, what we're talking about tonight. So, you know, people can check that out if they're in the, you know, the DMV uh, area there. And uh, I think the easiest way potentially to, to do that would be to go to your Twitter, or I guess we call it X now, uh, right. which is at B more Eisenberg, B M O R E Eisenberg, E I S E N B E R G. Right. Be more Eisenberg. You have the link in there for people to be yeah. able to check out. And that's something they can register and I guess go and, and see this live and, and so yeah. you talk about this and Doug Williams and Mike Loxley and these other folks. And uh, I think that'll probably be a very, very cool event for people. to be able Yeah. To. I'm looking forward to that. They uh, there's uh, definitely, uh, I mean, they put together something great there. So it's, it's really, and I'll, I can, I'll be selling books and signing books afterwards, but uh, nice. I think that'll be a really, really good panel. So it's yeah, really that's really cool. neat. And yeah. one last question for you, if I could, John, this is a very short, uh, short question, short answer. Do you already have an idea of what your next book's going to be? Uh, the short answer is no, I do not. <laughs> you know what? You're still, you have the old book rattling around in there. I you haven't had any time to have anything new rattle around yeah, yet. When I memorize, you know, it's just slowly <laughs> dripping out. So, uh, you know, when it drips out, maybe there'll be room for something else. So there you uh, go. We'll see. we'll see. Well, again, we want everyone to pick it up. Again, the book is called Rocket Men, the black quarterbacks who revolutionized pro football it is available basically anywhere you can get your hands on a book. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Amazon, eBay, any platform, bookstores, everything else. Uh, so check it out. It's definitely a good read and a great history lesson as well. And a lot of insight brought to it. So well done, John. And, and uh, we really, really appreciate you being able to be on the show tonight. Great. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you so much.